Welcome to Red Grace Media, everybody. This is Emilio Ramos. It's been a while since I've been with you and actually been a while since we've posted anything for the YouTube channel. Just kind of want to relaunch our YouTube channel and continue talking about uh, apologetics, evangelism, reform theology, and of course, culture. And today, um, as we kind of revamp what's going on, let me just kind of give you an update on Red Grace Media. Some of you guys were supporting our live broadcasts. Uh, these are all sort of pre-recorded episodes that I'm going to be sort of pumping out weekly and uh, hope that you'll enjoy those and I hope that uh, as you look at the material and what we're doing, I hope that it'll be a blessing to you. And uh, as we think about uh, Red Grace Media in the future, understand that redgracemedia.com is being reconstructed, everything is being rebuilt. I'm very excited about what's happening with Red Grace Media and if you don't know yet, um, there's a wonderful partnership that I have with um, AGTV. That's the, Ameri the makers of the American Gospel. Um, and AGTV is a streaming service that you should subscribe to. And if you want to support me personally, you should subscribe to that because of my partnership with them. That's just going to enable me uh, to make more content for AGTV. So go to uh, watchagtv.com right now and subscribe. Uh, today for that. You will not uh, be disappointed if you do that. Uh, but as it is with AGTV, I am producing all sorts of wonderful uh, theological content, whether it's for uh, content that I'm creating uh, for myself or content that I'm making with other folks, other theologians and other people. Um, just really excited about what the future holds for Red Grace Media and that partnership with AGTV. And again, stay tuned as to the website, redgracemedia.com, and all that's going to happen with there. It's going to be, it's going to be a completely different uh, enterprise altogether, and I hope that you will enjoy that. Now, um, many of you guys know Red Grace Media because of my open-air preaching videos. Matter of fact, I was just at the G3 conference, and I can't tell you how many people came up to me and expressed their gratitude and uh, had shared with me that it was uh, through watching one of the uh, open air preaching uh, videos on uh, at, at the at the UNT campus, that that sort of led them to their own uh, evangelism and you know their own desire to uh, get involved in uh, evangelism and apologetics in their local church. And of course, that's all great, wonderful. That's exactly what I wanted to do, uh, but. Those videos were done many, several years ago. I haven't returned to UNT, and so I haven't done any open-air preaching uh, in a while. However, um, my interests now have turned toward what I am calling uh, the new apologetic. And the new apologetic is uh, something that we're going to discuss today. And I guess I should define for us, what do I mean by the new apologetic? What What is entailed in that? And I just want to, I just want to, uh, uh, just read some things that I've uh, written down regarding precisely what is meant when we talk about a new apologetics, because what is not meant by that is any sort of departure from methodology. For example, uh, I am committed to the presuppositional method of apologetics uh, propounded by uh, Van Til and others. Uh, and so that's not changing. It's not so much a change in method as much as it is a change in focus. And I think that focus needs to change. But with a new apologetic comes a whole new focus and a whole new set of, of ideas and concepts and challenges that we have to be ready to face, that we have to be, be ready to confront biblically uh, and with a biblical worldview. And so when we're talking about the new apologetic, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about the fact that in today's culture and the context in which we live, a new vision of apologetics is necessary. An apologetics that is going to respond to the new and emerging world of the 21st century. The world around us, let's face it, is quickly changing and it's quickly becoming increasingly post-Christian. Let me just talk about that just for a moment because um, our church, Heritage Grace, uh, just recently did a book study for uh, the ladies in our church and for the men in our church. We both did a book study through Phil Riken's book on Jeremiah, uh, and um, that book was so wonderful, but, but that book was operating primarily on this presupposition that in the last several decades, our 
our, our country is increasingly becoming post-Christian. And he even showed how that in Jeremiah's time, uh, because of their captivity in Babylon, because of their Babylonian surroundings and pagan surroundings, they were essentially ministering in a non-Christian context so that like Jeremiah, or Jeremiah like us, was in a post-Christian environment. And there's a lot to learn from the book of Jeremiah, exactly what you do there. But when we think about post-Christianity, this is not at all to mean that there are no longer any Christians. This is not at all to mean that uh, the Christian witness has failed or anything of the sort, but that, but that what used to be the presupposition of the past, as we've gone, the way that I like to put it, is as we've gone from Billy Graham to COVID, COVID-19, uh, we have entered into a whole nother world. And so uh, as we're thinking about living in post-Christian times, we are again gonna face new challenges in the church that pose real obstacles uh, to the way that we minister the gospel to people today. And when we think about the rising challenge of what is approaching, the rising challenges that are coming our way, uh, these are different challenges that maybe the Christians have been focused on in the past. In past times, um, you go back in the history of apologetics, for example, for the last 50 years, our focus have, has been primarily summed up in the old book written by Walter Martin, The Kingdom of the Cults. And so there you saw Walter Martin addressing all the pseudo-Christian cults, um, Mormonism, Jehovah Witnesses, he talked about other world religions like Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism, and then all the different splinter cults that come from all of that. Um, but I would argue that where we're at today, though those things will never change, and, and, and sadly those kinds of false religions, false cults, and false spiritualities will always plague the Christian church, I believe that there is a new and emerging world comprised of completely different challenges that we need to take serious and that we need to be ready to confront as a Christian church. And some of those things, for example, are globalism, pluralism, uh, technocentric and transhumanist culture, post-secularism, spirituality and sexual uh, uh, paganism. And really, if you think about it, it's really uh, a spiritual and sexual paganism that is emerging and those things are quickly becoming one. And some are even arguing for a post-human culture altogether. Now let me just kind of tackle some of those things really quick. When we talk about globalism, we're talking about the fact that in our modern 21st century context, we are, as, as the, the more and more globalism and global thinking comes into view, um, the less and less freedom, personal freedom, uh, and civil rights we can expect to have in this present evil age and in the present system of the world that we live in. And so we should not be at all surprised that with the rise of globalism comes the undermining and the, and the collapse of personal freedom, personal liberty. And so that is something that we need to really consider. Matter of fact, uh, just traveling, like I said, going to G3, I couldn't, I couldn't, um, you know, I couldn't uh, help to notice that on the wall up at the counter behind uh, the stewardess at the American Airlines counter, as I went to go try to get a better seat, uh, there was a massive plaque on the wall that said "One World." And so globalism is really confronting us today with this idea that we are headed towards this, you know, one world government, one world system, one world order, one world uh, way of thinking, a globalist way of thinking that is united by various socioeconomic and spiritual aspects of the present evil age. And um, regardless of your eschatology, I don't think you can deny that that's exactly what's going on today. Now, as we go on from globalism, we think about pluralism. Now, what, what do we mean by pluralism? Well, pluralism is this idea that every philosophy, every religion, basically every worldview is equally right, and there's not one worldview that's more right than the other. It's a form of postmodernism, existentialism, and relativism. But pluralism, religious pluralism is, is, is particularly dangerous today in our culture because it's making inroads into all of our 
uh, institutions, into the government structures, into our economic structures, into our education structures in society. And so the more uh, that globalism increases, the more pluralism will increase. And pluralism is also increasing by virtue of immigration. I'll never forget, uh, as I drove into uh, the neighborhood that my wife and I used to live in, I remember uh, it was October, and as I drove in, I remember that half of the neighborhood was lit up in Christmas lights. And later, one of my neighbors informed me, oh no, those are not Christmas lights. I thought, it's October, it's kind of early to have your lights up. And um, no, somebody alerted me that those lights, in fact, had nothing to do with Christmas, nothing to do with Jesus, nothing to do with the American holiday. It had everything to do with a Hindu holiday and the celebration of paganism. And that was half the community. I don't know how many hundreds of homes were accounted for and were celebrating this pagan holiday. Therein lies a concrete example of what pluralism really looks like. If you think about technology, that's another reason why, as we fast forward into the day in which we're living, in the foreseeable future, that technology is going to become an increasing factor, like never before, that will impact the worldview level. And that's what we're really concerned with. We're not just concerned with technology for the sake of technology. We're not just concerned with talking about how, you know, a big tech is oppressive and is uh, big tech is I I becoming more and more intrusive into our lives. But as technocracy and technology increase, again, it just uh, lends to this idea of a globalistic kind of thinking. And it's really remarkable, matter of fact, uh, as we'll talk about uh, pagan spirituality here in a moment, but. As a matter of fact, though, the last Apple event that I watched, I was astounded at how often uh, throughout the presentation, the, the technology that was being revealed, the new, the new tech, no longer consisted of what it used to consist of. First, they reveal a very basic iPhone, and then they reveal a more intuitive iPhone, and then they reveal a bigger iPhone, and then they reveal an iPad. And then they reveal, you know, this gadget and that gadget. And then th there's these new uh, iPods that you wear and ear pods and, you know, all the accessories that come with making your gadget better. Now, uh, what has happened is now the audience is dazzled with this idea of how technology is more and more simply um, integrated into every single aspect of your life so that this thing can monitor the way that you breathe, the way that you walk, the way that you talk, what you say, what you think, what you're feeling, your emotion, your psychological state of mind. It can detect all of that. My understanding is that right now in the Congress, they're talking about passing legislation where cars are going to have to be manufactured with front-facing cameras so that the camera can detect if you're falling asleep while you're driving. Sounds really good. Maybe can stop a drunk driver in his tracks before he kills somebody. Um, but it can, also, um, it can also detect what mood you're in. And uh, as this kind of legislation comes down the pike, and the other thing rumored was that cars are going to be now built with breathalyzers so that, again, a car can tell you whether or not you're too intoxicated to drive and or whether or not you have uh, a virus and you don't qualify to drive. So as these kind of emerging, intrusive, technological uh, inroads are made into our lives, how does that affect the worldview level? How does that affect society fundamentally at a spiritual level, at a socioeconomic level, and how, how does that dictate the way that a person views themselves bearing in mind that, 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 these, that, that people are made in the image of God 
And we need to begin to really ask really soon how technology affects your status as the image of God. And so that leads me to the next thing, and that's the whole rise of what is known as transhumanism and even posthumanism. And that is technology that is integrated into our lives such that we are fundamentally either augmented by technology or we are fundamentally altered by our technology to such a degree that we really no longer even qualify for uh, being categorized as human. Now, now the, these are two different uh, approaches to, to, to the involvement or the merger of man and machine to the, uh, to, the, to the degrees in which technology will be integrated into your life. Um, there is a really good book I have somewhere laying around here uh, that was written by Jacob Schatzer. It's called Transhumanism and the Image of God. You should really pick it up and read it. It's one of the very first books that I've actually seen on the subject of transhumanism uh, that it was written from a respected scholarly um, uh, I, I'm not sure uh, what Jacob's uh, the, theology is. I think it's Reformed, but uh, I found it on the Westminster Theological uh, Bookstore, a seminary bookstore, and I think it's a good place to start thinking about how does biblical worldview issues affect a person's acceptance and imbibing of transhumanist thought. Uh, right now, as a matter of fact, there are many in the cutting edge technological and futurist world that are calling for things like in the next 10 years we will be inundated with wearable technology and by the end of the next decade uh, so that you know in the next decade or so basically in the next 10 years or so um, implantable technology will become absolutely commonplace and there's numerous TED talks where you can see that in fact, the, these futurists are talking about children that in fact will be so inundated in technology that they will basically look back at a generation like ours and wonder how on earth we ever survived without implantable technology. Now, the good news for us is that we have a living hope. What is our living hope? Our living hope in Christ is not a hope that we are going to undo all of the wild fantasies of futurists and technological singularitists, I guess, maybe I just made that word up, but you know, it's not that we're gonna, it's not that we are going to take over the Ray Kurzweil's of the world and we're going to undo, for those of you who don't know who Ray Kurzweil is, you should, he's a top leading uh, Google engineer uh, today. Uh, but who also has done deep work in futurism, and that's his focus, transhumanism being at the very pinnacle of where he's at. Um, we'll be talking about Ray Kurzweil quite a bit in future episodes, but, um, but as it is, um, these uh, technological futurists are now saying that a generation will emerge, will arise very soon, where uh, a child will, no, will not even understand his or her anthropology apart from total technological singularity down to the very uh, utilization of technology within the body. So implantables will become absolutely commonplace. And so there is that. There is the rise of transhumanism and posthumanism. And for Christians who have the living hope, the true living hope is not that we sort of uh, take over the present evil world the present evil age, we transform it and turn all things pagan into all things Christian. No, our living hope is the return of Jesus Christ, of course. It is Christ revealed, as the Apostle Paul tells us, to set our faith, to set our mind completely on the revelation uh, that is to be brought to us uh, through, or at the grace that is to be brought to us through the revelation of Jesus Christ. I think it's the Apostle Paul or Peter, maybe, I don't know, if, might have my books messed up, but, but, but it is that hope. It is the hope that the resurrected Christ will return and will make all things right. And so that eschatological hope is going to become absolutely essential uh, as we think about all these powerful, emerging, tectonic issues that are on the horizon. Let me just go on here and things that I...
can scarcely find a, uh, a hip hop artist, uh, a commercial, uh, a music award show that doesn't uh, showcase some level of pagan spirituality, some level of Satanism, overt Satanism. And you can go down the line and you can list all of the people. I don't even know the names of the people around today. I stopped watching MTV and those kinds of things back when, oh, I don't know, when Michael Jackson was still alive or something. But, you know, uh, before I was saved, after that, I just saw it for what it was. But, but when you think about the emergence of both sexual and, and uh, spiritual and sexual paganism, it's just amazing to think. Let's go back for a second to the Apple event that recently came out. I was astounded how often in that Apple event references to paganism were made by way of yoga, by way of meditation, by way of mental health, uh, mental wellness, by way of apps and technology and uh, things that are integrated into your life to remind you to engage in things like meditation and, and, and breathing exercises that were all pagan. And so increasingly, we see the emergence of paganism all around us, and we need to be very, very much aware of what's going on. Uh, let me just recommend one book at this, at this point. I think it's important for me to, uh, to recommend to you. If you don't have the book by Peter Jones, and I don't know if you can see this really well. I'll bring it up a little bit closer. Uh, the Other Worldview by Dr. Jones is a very, very important book uh, that stresses this whole notion of the rise of pagan spirituality, pagan sexuality, because really those things go together. And uh, if you haven't read Dr. Jones's work, you need to do that. I recently filmed Dr. Jones for a documentary uh, that we are going to be producing, Red Grace Media, and also uh, in a month or so, I'll be with Dr. Jones again to do an in-depth, a deep dive into the various principles that he teaches in this book and in other places. But you, you have to keep your eye on what's happening with paganism. Um, the emergence of pagan spirituality is everywhere. Uh, again, uh, having done evangelism and apologetics on a college campus for over 11 years and then of course witnessing and doing evangelism elsewhere for many many other years uh, I can tell you that paganism is a serious thing I can tell you tell you that paganism can be capital P lowercase p there are those who are pagan with a capital P in subscribing officially subscribing technically technically and formally identifying with a false religion a false cult whether it's Buddhism or Hinduism or Islam or something like that and then there is a lowercase p where these people are virtually pagan by the way they live their life, by the way they think, by the way they view themselves, by the, by the way that they view their sexuality. One of the things that Peter Jones points out in his book and does a marvelous job of pointing this out, and that is that at the very high point of the emerging paganism that's coming to the West, that is threatening to swallow the West, is the emergence of androgyny. And uh, Peter Jones identifies it as the high sacrament of, of Eastern paganism that's really, uh, that's coming here in all of its forms. And he shows that throughout the history of religion and the history of paganism and the history of spirituality, Dr. Jones points out how that always the mixing of the sexes of a uh, non-binary shaman or a non-binary priesthood of some sort, a spiritual guru, a spiritual cult leader always emerges on the scene. Many of the Hindu sects have for their spiritual leaders and their spiritual gurus men uh, that claim uh, that they have reached the point where they have reached sort of this oneist kind of philosophy where they have they have uh, eliminated the binary and they have just emerged as a androgynous uh, person of some kind. And all that it is is ultimately reduces to paganism and pantheism or even panantheism. Those distinctions between pantheism, 
uh, and panentheism are important. One is that everything is God. The other one is that cre uh, the creation and God are sort of in a rela related, interdependent sort of relationship. But really today, probably what predominates more than anything is a pantheistic, a virtual pagan and pantheistic thought where people believe themselves to be simply one, that everything is all the same. Um, there is a gentleman that goes throughout Israel asking uh, uh, both Jews and uh, Muslims whether or not Jews, Muslims, and Christians all worship the same God. And you can see repeatedly, you can find person after person after person that espouses that, yes, in fact, um, we all worship the same God. And you can find uh, Muslims, you can find Jews, but mostly Christians who reject that notion, but even some uh, Catholics and Christians that, uh, that self-identify as Catholic and Christian that say, yes, we're all worshiping the same God. And you can even find this in a lot of Christian writers that would say that we're all worshiping the same God. And of course, that is absolutely false because the Bible presents Romans chapter 1 that you either worship the true and living God or you engage in a great exchange where you exchange the truth for the lie. You exchange the truth of the true and living God, the creator-creature distinction. You eliminate that and you instead adopt a pagan view of God. You adopt a view of God where everything is the same. There's no distinctions. Um, nature is all. We are in nature. We are one with nature. God is nature. Therefore, we are one with God. Therefore, we are God. And that's the way that it goes. Yoga is an exercise in which you invoke that very reality. You're invoking the reality that you are God, that you are divine. And that's why Romans chapter 1 is so absolutely essential. So as we think about the new apologetic, we're talking along lines of globalist, pluralistic, technocentric, transhumanist, posthumanist, spiritual and sexual paganism, and we're also thinking about the rise of, of, of a society that no longer identifies any distinctions whatsoever. In one sense, and we'll cover this in a future episode in depth, we are living in a post-everything world. So that today, um, if you want to talk about the new apologetics, the new apologetics, the way that I see it, is that we seek to, we seek to reach people where they are, where they live. And where the modern man lives is he lives in this globalistic, pagan, pluralistic sort of world. And it's a hypersexual narcissistic, nihilistic, and hedonistic society inundated by and saturated by a technological world where people increasingly do not even know what it means to be human apart from this modern, technological, hypersexualized, pagan, and uh, pluralistic world that we live in. What of the old apologetic? What about the old apologetic? Simply put, much of the apologetics of the 19th and 20th century uh, has begun to kind of lose its steam and society at large, even those that subscribe to older forms of, this, uh, of these categories of what you find in Kingdom of the Cults, the pseudo-Christian cults are becoming increasingly pluralistic, technocentric, transhumanist, pansexual, and ultimately post-human themselves. But what exactly do all of these ideas mean and how does the Christian worldview rise to the challenge is something that we will leave for a future episode. And let me just end with this, and that is that I believe that Christianity is a robust biblical worldview and that there are a couple aspects of the biblical worldview that have gone neglected and because they've been neglected, we haven't used them to their fullest potential. And those two things increasingly are going to become a robust covenantal doctrine of the image of God 
and a robust eschatology where the eschatology that we uh, subscribe to, and I'm not talking about eschatology in terms of the things that we tend to fight about, uh, the rapture, the timing of the return, the nature of the millennium. Okay, we can debate all of that stuff till the cows come home, and I'm, glad, I'm, I'm happy to do that. But I'm talking about the fact, and let me end with this, I'm talking about the fact that the modern man, so this is what the, this is what the new apologetics does, is it says to the modern man, you are fundamentally sub-eschatological. You are fundamentally in denial of your eschatological identity as an image bearer of God. And therefore, like the old Epicureans, you don't believe you have a soul, you don't believe there is a God who is a judge, you don't believe in death and the afterlife that will come and issue forth in some sort of uh, final a cosmic judgment both for you and for the present order of things, and therefore you believe the world is just an endless uh, succession of random events that will go on uh, in some sort of infinite stream of meaninglessness. And so we're back to this, that in the new apologetic, we're still talking about meaning, morals, beauty. Thank you, Van Tilt. Thank you, Francis Schaeffer, and many others. We're still talking about a worldview issue. We're still talking about arguing by way of transcendental reasoning or presupposition. We're still talking about the antithesis and how that without God, all things reduce to meaninglessness and that people don't understand their proper authority, that people don't understand what it means to be epistemically self-conscious, that people don't understand the transcendental nature of things like logic and reason, meaning, morals, ethics, epistemology, and metaphysics. And so all those things we have to bring to bear in a new apologetic as we venture into the 21st century. We can no longer be reduced to arguing about textual variants within the Greek manuscript tradition. We'll probably always have to do that. But we can never be, but we can no longer be beholden to simply talking about the cults of the past or the distinction between major religions. There is a sense in which there is emerging one religion. Not that everyone believes the same thing, but that everybody that believes the false things they believe are united against the one true thing the true and living God in biblical, historic Christianity. That's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed Red Grace Media relaunching, revamping, and I hope that you will, uh, I hope that you'll enjoy this and pass it on. God bless you.